the situation reached crisis in 1885 when smallpox broke out in Montreal. After a week in which over 200 French Canadians had died in Montreal, the people took to the streets. Quarantine placards were torn down. The East End office of the Board of Health was destroyed. The mob broke into the health offices of City Hall, throwing disinfectants and posters out the windows. Finally, the mob marched to the home of the city's medical health officer, shouting threats of murder. The officer narrowly escaped out his back door. In the last six months of 1832, over 7,000 people died in the province of Quebec. In Ontario, where vaccination and quarantine had been practiced, only 21 deaths were attributed to the disease. Mass fatality proved to the Quebec public what argument and legislation could not. And 1885 was the last major smallpox epidemic in that province's history. A vigorous public health movement was gathering steam, making grinding progress against age-old hindrances, ignorance, indifference, hostility to change. Much of the battle for improved public health was fought in schools. Around the turn of the century, an attempt was made to keep children with infectious diseases out of school and quarantined. But some families concealed cases of diseases like diphtheria to avoid home quarantine or the isolation hospital. Pressure built for some kind of systematic medical inspection in the schools. But one medical officer in Toronto called the idea a pure fad instituted principally by women. From 1906 to 1914, most urban school systems did adopt medical inspection. A powerful force behind this change was the Canadian Public Health Association, formed in 1910. The association pushed for vaccination of school children against smallpox and for school medical inspections. From that time to this, the CPHA can be found behind practically every progressive change in Canadian public health. Another turn of the century health controversy concerned milk. Raw milk is a great carrier of disease, typhoid, diphtheria, tuberculosis, to name just a few. Nevertheless, pasteurization was resisted by dairies, by the public, and even by doctors. A 1914 study concluded that 90% of Montreal's milk was unfit for human consumption. Compulsory pasteurization was recommended, but civic and public resistance did not give way until 1925. By 1927, Montreal milk was pasteurized, but a dairy worker carrying typhoid contaminated the pasteurized milk, touching off an epidemic in the city that killed 533. It was a grim reminder that health and sanitation laws are not enough. The rules are useless unless enforced. Canada's early immigration booms were periods of bad public health. This was again true when Canada embarked on its drive to populate the West after the turn of the century. It's not surprising that Winnipeg, the most populous Western boom city, had the distinction in 1905 of having the most typhoid deaths of any major North American or European city. The Victorian Order of Nurses is perhaps best known for developing home nursing in Canada, but through its milk stations, child health clinics, and prenatal classes, it also imparted much knowledge of health hygiene to these new Canadians. In the 1880s, railway construction brought typhoid to central British Columbia. Mining and smelting towns like Caslow, Golden, Slocan, 
Sandon, Fernie, and Trail were usually built on steep inclines with their open privy pits draining into watercourses that fed other villages downstream. The companies were unwilling to carry out improvements that might threaten their profits. When the economy boomed, typhoid boomed, a pattern lasting into the late 1930s, long after the disease had been eradicated in the rest of the country. During World War I, few had cause to doubt the courage of Canada's soldiers. But many, for good reason, doubted their health. A scathing 1916 Canadian government report described the number of Canadians arriving in England medically unfit for service. When the troops returned, they brought with them venereal disease, tuberculosis, and Spanish influenza. In 1918, one out of six Canadians had the Spanish flu. Between 30 and 50,000 died. In Alberta, it was compulsory to wear masks outside the home. A poor protection, but the best available. In these images of victory parades in Alberta in 1918, we see joy over war's end and the almost cavalier pulling down of the masks as if disease would somehow respect a day of celebration. The flu epidemic had one positive side effect. It made people feel the lack of a nationwide organization capable of handling such a health emergency. This led in 1919 to the creation of a federal department of health The Roaring Twenties was a creative time, a time to put war behind and progress ahead. A perfect emblem of the era was the discovery of insulin by Canadians. When Frederick Banting and his colleagues injected an eight-year-old diabetic with insulin in 1922, saving his life, they were in fact saving the lives of millions of future diabetics an achievement that won the 1923 Nobel Prize. Public health made considerable strides in the 1920s. In 1919, Dr. Gordon Bates organized the Canadian Social Hygiene Council, dedicated to fighting venereal disease and all other preventable diseases. Later called the Health League of Canada, but still led by Dr. Bates, the organization published the magazine Health and played a powerful health advocacy role. In Prince Edward Island, Mona Wilson built her one nurse public health movement into a provincial department of health. She served the cause of public health in Prince Edward Island for 32 years, winning the highly respected and rarely awarded Florence Nightingale Medal for her efforts. Physician researcher Dr. Gordon Bell played that kind of central role in the development of public health in Manitoba, as did Dr. Henry Essen Young in British Columbia. The Great Depression was a definite break in the progress of Canadian public health. Poverty and ill health go hand in hand, and during the 1930s, the health care system was burdened by people who were ill and could not pay for help. Economic recovery during World War II may have put an end to the Depression, but it didn't eradicate people's memories of how the poor had suffered in the 30s. Many wondered again if it was not time for some form of health insurance. It is not surprising that Saskatchewan the province that suffered most under the combined scourge of drought and depression was the first to pass a universal hospital insurance plan in 1947. 